Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. This is Fitz Critter. Welcome to the Minister's Corner, where we are continuing our study on the book of Romans. In fact, it's called the Beginner's Guide to the Book of Romans, and we are on part three, episode three of that particular study series. Also, we have an ebook. If you want to download it, it's a free PDF. Yes, I said free. Scan the QR code, or you can check out the link in the description down below. Now, in today's video, we are continuing. Uh, this is our part two of discussing the Apostle Paul. So in the previous video on the Beginner's Guide to the Book of Romans, we were up to Paul's first missionary journey. So we covered that particular amount of territory as we're walking through a timeline about his life. And I read this last week. I want to read it this week again to rehearse this in your hearing. The Apostle Paul, whose life and teachings are central to the book of Romans, is one of the most influential figures in Christian history. Understanding his background, conversion, and ministry context is crucial for comprehending the significance of the book of Romans. And this is really the point here. This is why I'm spending this much time, and we can spend more time just studying Paul's life. Uh, my goal is to wrap it up in this particular video, but we have to understand and get a glimpse, a peek into Paul's life to really begin to understand not only Romans, but all of the letters that he wrote, because his letters were so very personal in nature. And so in order to understand the personal nature of his letters or epistles, what they're commonly called in theological circles, we have to understand the man himself and all that he went through and all that he experienced because Paul often says that he was a slave to the gospel, a slave of Jesus Christ. This was his life. This was it for Paul. His whole, after the conversion on the road to Damascus, he was completely sold out, bought in, locked in, bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's important to understand something about Paul himself. Now, this is where we left off on this particular point in the timeline. So let's go ahead and hop on in. And so we see here where Paul has written his first letter. So for those of you who are interested in what order Paul wrote his letters in, you'll see them in this particular video. So you can jot these down uh, as to sort of the order in which Paul's letters were written. You know, according to uh, various scholars and those who are researchers as it relates to this particular topic. So the first letter, the first epistle written is to the church in Galatia. We don't have a date, but that is the first letter that Paul has written. The next in this timeline, and all of this is through the book of Acts. So everything that we're going through in this particular timeline of Paul's life, the overwhelming majority of it you find in the book of Acts as we go through uh, Paul's particular journeys. So in his intro as, and Paul sees a vision telling him to go to Macedonia. This is also during the time period where Paul is uh, on his second missionary journey. This story in Troas, this vision that Paul sees is important. And I believe there is something that we can glean, we can learn from this particular experience. So let's go ahead and read the story in the book of Acts. So we are Acts chapter 16, where this particular occurrence is happening. So 16, uh, verse 6 in the NLT translation. Next, Paul and Silas traveled through the area of Phrygia and Galatia because the Holy Spirit had prevented or forbidden, if you would do a word study, that word prevented actually translates to the word forbidden, so they were stopped, not allowed, for them from preaching the word in the province of Asia at that time. So it's, it's pretty clear here that this is where Paul wanted to go. They're in the region already, so it's not like this was a far distance that Paul had to travel to get to this area of Asia, but the Holy Spirit said, no, you cannot go there. So they were 
prevent it. Verse 7 and 8, then coming to the borders of Messia, which is north, so they, they didn't go into Asia, so Paul heads up north, going towards uh, Messiah. They headed north for the province of Bithynia. So now Paul says, hey, we're going toward Messiah. Bithynia is right here. Perhaps they can go in there and, and speak the gospel. But again, the spirit of Jesus did not allow them to go there. So instead, they went on through Messiah to the seaport of Troas. Verses 9 and 10. That night, Paul had a vision. A man from Macedonia, northern Greek, was standing there pleading with him, come over to Macedonia and help us. So we decided to leave for Macedonia at once, having concluded that God was calling us to preach the good news there. I want to highlight one point in verse 10. It says, so we, Luke is the author of Acts, and if you read commentaries, uh, if you have a good study Bible that kind of talks about this particular verse, it sounds like Luke was with them because he said we decided to leave versus they decided to leave for Macedonia. So it appears that Luke was with Paul and Silas at this particular time. So Paul has this vision. It says they concluded. If you do a word study, and I've done some videos on this channel about how to do word studies, you can check those videos out. Also, I've been planning to do one for the past couple of months on how to use AI, like ChatGPT, on how to do a Greek or Hebrew word study using that particular tool. Uh, I'm, I've got it all prepared and ready to go, just hadn't recorded the video yet. But if you do a word study on the word concluded, it actually means to come together or to unite. So I think a better translation would be that they came together in agreement that God was calling us to preach the good news there. So you can see the Holy Spirit is working and guiding and moving and stopping certain things because you can receive direction through rejection. Paul, Silas, and the crew, they can't go through Asia. They can't go through Bithynia. Clearly through this vision, they're supposed to go to Macedonia. But this is a really good lesson on being led by the Spirit. As intellectual as Paul was, as bold as he was in preaching the gospel, and clearly Paul would go anywhere to go ahead and preach the good news. He still needed to be directed. Yes, he's a, a master at the law. Yes, he received direct revelation from Jesus Christ as it relates to the gospel. He had a miraculous transformation. Paul is doing what God is calling him to do. And yet even Paul had to be led by the Holy Spirit because He's called by Jesus. And we, now we really get to see Paul being a slave to Jesus Christ, a slave to the gospel, not going everywhere he wanted. God directed him. Now, I want us to get our bearings because we're talking about these cities, Galatia, Troas, <laughs> Massa. Where is all of this? So let's take a look at a map and let's get our bearings as to where we are. So, of course, all of this is in what is known as modern day Turkey for the most of what we see here. So there's uh, Galatia and Phrygia. So they were in this particular region. So if they were to head just directly west, they would go through Asia. Makes sense. They're right there, so they can go through Asia, preach the gospel, and they will be good. But no, the Holy Spirit prevented them from going there. And so as they're going north towards Messiah, which is over to the left, there's Bithynia right there. Hey, we can just cut up through here. We can go ahead and spread the good news as well, but no. Holy Spirit says, you can't go to Asia. You can't go to Bithynia. And then... There is a vision that says they are to go over to Macedonia. I don't have it on this map, but it's across the water. It's over in Greece is where they would end up going to Macedonia. So as I was thinking about this, if there are two popular questions in Christendom amongst not only new believers, but just believers in general, even mature believers ask this question, 
Number one is how do I discern or hear the voice of God? And number two, how is it that I can be led by the Holy Spirit? So I want to use Acts 16 as a backdrop. Acts 16 verses 6 through 10. I want to sort of take that particular occurrence in Scripture where Paul is directed and led by the Holy Spirit. I want to and I want to draw out six keys to being led by the Holy Spirit. And I want to share something with you now. I have used these six keys. I use them now on being led by the Holy Spirit. Me and my wife have gone through this and I've seen God lead me into the place he would have me to be incorporating these six keys. Now, there are other issues, there are other keys or other points of wisdom. Uh, there's other things out there that also could be included. But uh, I want to boil this down to something manageable. And I believe that if you press into these six keys, really take them to heart, take some notes, jot this down, screenshot this if you need to. So if you are. Someone who's, you know what, I don't know what to do. I don't know what the Lord's calling me to, to pursue. I don't know if I should go over here, take this job, marry this person, uh, leave this location. I don't know. I need to be led by the Holy Spirit. I need to hear a word from God. So I want to share this with you because I personally, along with my wife as well, found these steps to be um, helpful. Number one should be obvious to all of us, prayer. Just as Paul received guidance through a vision, Christians today can seek guidance through prayer. Spend time in prayer, asking the Holy Spirit to lead you and reveal God's will. Prayer is so very crucial, so very important. This is where God has set up this particular method, this mode of communicating with Him. So as we go before God in prayer, this is where we can begin to start this process of being led by God. And um, and I will say this, there's very few times I've prayed once and <laughs> it all came together. So you may have to be persistent in prayer. The Bible tells us to pray always. The Bible teaches us to be persistent in prayer. And it's not like God doesn't remember what you said the first time, but it's still about us being engaged in the prayer until you receive sort of that inner witness that you believe God has, has heard you and you feel as though, okay, I've said all I need to say regarding this. I'm going to put this into the hands of the Lord. So, but the first step is prayer. And I want to kind of give you guys a little bit of guidance on prayer. If you're, if you're a new believer uh, or you're struggling with prayer, there's something called the Acts prayer model. You can go online and look that up. It's a particular prayer model that I often use. And so A stands for adoration, uh, C stands for confession, T stands for thanksgiving, and the S stands for supplication. It is based on what we normally call the Lord's Prayer. You know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So that particular model of prayer that Jesus taught the disciples, you can break that down into this Acts Prayer model, A C T S. Go online, do a search, and you'll find some guidance around that. So I think it'll be a help you, helpful for those of you who are looking to learn more and how to be more effective in your prayer life. Number two, listening. So as you've gone through God in prayer, have an attitude, pay attention to those gentle nudges and promptings in your heart. My wife and I normally say, hey, follow the breadcrumbs, right? That's just our way of saying is that we have a gentle nudge. Uh, or a prompt in our heart that we are supposed to go a certain place and we're, we're still sort of not sure. We, we feel a nudge, we feel a prompt. And so we're going to carefully investigate, right? Because the Holy Spirit often speaks through our inner convictions and a sense of what is right and aligned with God's word. And we also understand that sometimes it's not a gentle nudge. It is a strong, deep, and powerful conviction in your heart where it is clear as to what it is you want to do or the direction you're supposed to go in. Uh, went through that recently last year where there was a powerful conviction in our heart. And when we came to the right conclusion, 
which was the only conclusion we knew that God was telling us to make this certain decision, that conviction, that heaviness lifted. And that was a witness to us that we had made the right choice, that we had made a decision in line with the will of God. But it starts with a listening. Now, you've heard people say, God told me, God told me, God told me. I can count maybe on one hand and probably just half the fingers, the times I've heard something of an audible voice. Most of what I hear is just in my heart. There's an inner conviction, there's an inner witness that God is speaking. So number two is listening. Number three, confirmation. I want to be careful here. When I originally uh, wrote this, I had seek confirmation through trusted Christian friends and mentors. But I changed the word from seek to anticipate because if you are seeking, meaning you are going after it and looking for it, you can get yourself into trouble because if you have, particularly if you have a desire to go into a particular direction, sometimes you will seek others who confirm what you want to do. Been there, done that. I don't think seek is a, 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 a good word. I think anticipate is a better because what you want to do is be open to receiving confirmation. And you want to put that into the Lord's hands. Lord, I pray that you would send confirmation on whether I should do X, Y, Z and allow him to bring forth trusted Christian friends, mentors or through the study of scripture. Right. The Holy Spirit's goddess will never contradict the teachings of the Bible. Now, the one thing that I don't have in these six keys as it relates to being led by the Holy Spirit, Bible study. Consistent reading of scripture. This is how you know you're not going to a direction that is not confirmed or backed up or supported by the Bible if you don't know what the Bible teaches. Constant, consistent, everyday reading of the Bible. If you are a new believer, I highly encourage you to start a one-year Bible reading plan and pick a translation that is comfortable for you. If you're a new Christian, I suggest the NLT, the New Living Translation, or the NIV, or the Christian Standard Bible, the CSB, or some of those translations where the English language has been updated in a way that you can understand. If you are a newer believer, say you're a teenager in your early 20s, definitely I suggest the New Living Translation. That's the Bible versions I'm using for this course because this course is a beginner's guide. So I wanted to use a translation that would be conducive for those who are new. And so, because I want you to understand everything that I'm teaching here. Study the Bible. Anticipate confirmation. So let me give you an example of this. Me and my wife were waiting on the Lord uh, in order to make a particular decision. So one night, it was like, I saw it in the next day, but it was like three o'clock in the morning, I get a DM on Facebook from a trusted Christian friend regarding a matter that he knew nothing about, that me and my wife were uh, in the midst of deciding on which way to go or what direction we should take. He sends me a random DM about something that he thinks is unrelated. And I said, okay. So I follow that. So that started a prompt, right? That started a prompt because it was something we were planning to do, but we weren't fully committed and bought in quite yet. So we were kind of, uh, you know, kind of on the fence. But this DM on Facebook from a trusted Christian friend of mine, a brother I served with for years, that was a prompt. That was a nudge that got us off the fence. And we began to move and take action. And then we saw more confirmation. We continued to follow the breadcrumbs until we came to a conclusion that this is the will of the Lord at this point. So confirmation Allow God to bring that to you so that you won't find yourself seeking something that may not be the right type of confirmation. Because remember, the enemy wants to derail you. He wants to distract you. He does not want you to fulfill the will of God. So this is why I say allow the Holy Spirit to bring confirmation. And if you, and if you receive something, 
hey, discuss it with somebody you trust. Maybe it's a pastor, maybe it's another fellow believer, maybe it's a friends and family. Uh, also, to if you will need to flush out that particular confirmation. Openness. Be ready to act when you believe the Spirit is leading. Sometimes this might mean stepping out of your comfort zone to help others or share the gospel. You have to be open. So if you're going to be led by the Holy Spirit, you may be led somewhere where you don't feel completely comfortable. Hey, Jesus, after he's baptized, is led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. Right. So sometimes that can happen. So just be open to where the Holy Spirit is leading you and sort of the other side of that coin, uh, flexibility. So flexibility and openness are two sides of the same coin. Be open to the Holy Spirit's leading. Be open to the Holy Spirit's leading, even if it doesn't align with your plans. Paul was on his way somewhere, but changed his course in response to the vision. So, again, when you are flexible, you can be led by rejection, by being forbidden. You can be led when a door is closed, just like you can be led when a door is open. It's like a maze, right? There's, there's several ways you can go. The majority of the ways you can go do not lead to the opening, do not lead to the end. There is only one path that leads to the end, and God knows where that path is that you should take in order for you to reach the goal that he has ordained for your life. Be flexible. Patience. Sometimes the Holy Spirit's guidance unfolds over time. It might not always be immediate or clear direction. <laughs> Let me tell you something. You could pray. You can get the prompts. You can confirmation. You're open. You're flexible. You move where you believe you think God has taken you. And it still might not be comfortable. There still may be some unfolding. Just because you arrive at the place doesn't mean that God is not still working some things out. So continue to have patience. Continue to be listening. Continue to be prayerful uh, as God makes the direction more and more clear. So that's it for the six keys. I hope this was helpful. Uh, so now let's look at a map of Paul's second missionary journey, just kind of take a look. So you see Paul is kind of broadening out a little more than from his first missionary journey. Got a few more cities here he has hit, but uh, just so you guys, I have a visual of the places he went during his second missionary journey. I thought it was important to sort of bring up this particular map. So now Paul is in Philippi. He cast out a spirit from a slave girl and is then imprisoned. So this slave girl was a fortune teller and she was doing fortune fortune telling for her masters, making, of course, money for them. Paul is irritated by her. He cast the devil out because the demon was the source of the fortune telling. <laughs> Did you hear that? The demonic world was behind the fortune telling of this slave girl. So once the devil's cast out, guess what? No more fortune telling. And guess what? She's now no longer earning money for her masters. So we pick the story up in verse uh, 20 here in Acts 16. It says the whole city is in an uproar because these Jews, they shout out to the city officials. They are teaching customs that are illegal for us Romans to practice. Now, what is illegal about casting out a devil? Well, it wasn't the casting out of a devil. It was the fact that the gospel was disrupting their business. It was interrupting uh, their money making, their money maker, right? So this girl was, you know, going and telling fortunes and they were getting, getting paid, getting paid handsomely, I'm assuming. And so this was about their lifestyle, their customs, their culture being interrupted by the gospel. 
And that's what Paul was doing as he's going from these cities. He's dealing with the demonic. He's dealing with idolatry. He's dealing with all sorts of immoral behavior. And the gospel comes in as being preached and people being delivered and being saved. And yes, it is turning the city upside down. And yes, they're in an uproar, particularly in the first century, because that's what the gospel was designed to do, to penetrate the wickedness, to penetrate the evil, to turn people's lives around. And guess what? The enemy will not be happy with that. It will not be pleased. So as a result, Paul is thrown into prison. Whew, man, but the gospel still has to move forward. This is fascinating. So the Bible says that Paul was severely beaten and he was thrown into jail. This is a very popular story. So I want to read this in your hearing because I think what I want us to understand is that the Bible says Paul was a drink offering poured out. The Bible says that Jesus told Paul he was going to show him the things that he must suffer. Right. And that we kind of I put out a separate video talking about I believe Paul's suffering was for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of Christ. Not necessarily because of the things of his past where he was persecuted Christians before he was transformed on the road to Damascus. But in this story, we see the suffering and the salvation, right? We see Paul suffering, but yet as a result of his suffering, of being uh, his perseverance, uh, him being beaten, thrown into prison, somebody's life is completely turned around. So let's read through this, Acts 16, 25 through 27. At around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. After being thrown into prison and beaten, they found the strength to worship. And this is a very important for all of us to learn, a very key. Can you find the strength to worship in the midst of your pain and your suffering? And other prisoners were listening. Suddenly, there was a massive earthquake and the prison was shaken to its foundations. All the doors immediately flew open and the chains of every prisoner fell off. The jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open. He assumed the prisoners had escaped, so he drew his war to kill, swore to kill himself. Now, during this particular time, if you were a Roman guard or soldier, and somebody escaped on your watch, then you could oftentimes get the penalty that that person would have received, that prisoner, or you would just have been killed yourself. So, uh, the, the Philippian jailer, knowing that, he decided just, hey, yeah, you know what? I'm not going to wait on, the, on that torture. I'm going to take things into my own hands. So we see that happening here. So let's continue the story. Verses 20 through 31. But Paul shouted, stop. Don't kill yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Love that sentence. That's somebody whose heart has really been touched by the power of God. That's someone who really desires to be saved. When you come running to the altar asking that question, oh, God is moving on you. They replied, for those of you who have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you come across this video, here should be your answer when you want to receive Christ as Lord and Savior. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved along with everyone in your household. So what we see here in these verses is the plan for God's life, uh, Paul's life being fulfilled, right? The prophecy is, Paul, you're going to suffer for the sake of the gospel. So we see Paul going through the suffering and we see the salvation. If you're going to suffer for the sake of the gospel, then our expectation is the outcome would be those would come to Christ. There were those who will be saved. So we see this here in the book of Acts. So now Paul is in Thessalonica and he's forced to leave because he starts a riot. <laughs> so Acts 17 verse 5, but some of the Jews were jealous. So they gathered some troublemakers from the marketplace to form a mob and start a riot. They attacked the home of Jason, searching for Paul and Silas so they could drag them out to the crowd. Paul is fighting several fronts. First of all, he is fighting Jewish culture. As Paul is on his missionary journeys, these Jewish communities oftentimes were very small. As people are being saved, 
And there's another category called the God fears, right? These were people who were non-Jewish. They were Gentiles, but yet they would go to the synagogue because they did believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They did believe in Yahweh. And so you have the Jews getting saved. You have these God fears being saved. So what's happening is their community is shrinking and they're losing influence. Those who are jealous because they see the power of God coming forth through the gospel and people are going to this new thing called the way or the church, the body of Christ, and they are leaving the synagogue, some of them. You have these Jews who are trying to protect, right, their status, protect their community. Then the other thing that Paul is facing, what we just saw a moment ago, is Greek and Roman culture. A lot of it was just based on idolatry and wickedness and demonic activity, like soothsayers, like fortune tellers. So he's fighting that as well. But so you see here that uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ is coming to disturb all of their particular lifestyles. Great story in Acts 17. This is where Paul is now heading over to Athens and he is speaking to those who are of the Greco-Roman world. In Athens, they were into things like philosophy and poems and stories and great thinkers and, you know, just in here talking around, uh, tossing around various ideas. They had various groups like the Stoics and there's others. And so Paul is coming here and Paul does something masterful here. They are full of idols and idolatry. And Paul is disturbed by seeing all these idols. But there's one shrine that has something written on it that says, to the unknown God. And so what Paul does is he uses this opportunity to explain to them who this unknown God is. And so he begins to explain uh, Jesus to them. And they're listening, but they're saying, you know what, Paul, this is some weird stuff, <laughs> but we'll go ahead and hear you out. And so there was a place called Mars Hill, where all of these great intellectuals and thinkers and philosophers will go and meet and have discussions. And so Paul is addressing them there. And he does something really incredible. Paul uses one of their own poems or one of their own popular sayings, and he uses it to explain Christ. So Acts 17, 28 says, For in him we live and move and exist. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. So he's talking about the Lord Jesus, but he uses something common to their culture that they would understand, which is really what is great about having various ways to preach the gospel. You know, I served 10 years or so street ministry, street evangelism. And that was something we also tried to do. You know, whenever we went through our evangelism class, they say things like, you know, don't use a lot of Christianese, uh, a lot of church lingo, because people who are unchurched will be confused. They won't understand all of that. They'll speak to them in a language that they understand. And so this was a powerful evangelism tool that Paul would use here, is using their own culture uh, to effectively communicate the gospel. So here is uh, a few other of Paul's timeline. I'm not going to go into detail to each one of them, uh, but I do want to kind of mention one that I'm going to talk about. For those of you who are keeping track, Paul is now writes 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, and he is in Corinth, and Paul stands before uh, Gallio Proconsul in Achia. I do want to talk about that for a, a moment, but Let's kind of walk the rest of the timeline. He goes back to Antioch. Paul begins his third missionary journey during this time period. Paul is baptizing and preaching in Ephesus. The Holy Spirit comes upon the baptized. And then Paul writes 1 Corinthians, for those who keep in track of the order of the books that Paul is writing. But now I want to take a look a little bit more about what's happening here in Corinth at this particular time. When you go and read Acts 18, you can get a sense that Paul is a bit frustrated. You know, think about all the times Paul has been kicked out of the synagogue, ran out of town, stoned, beaten. And in Corinth, Paul is speaking to the Jews. He's in the synagogue. They are rejecting his message. Paul is being insulted. And he may have at this point reached the breaking point. And Paul says, you know what? I'm going to the Gentiles. And so it, we, you kind of get the sense that Paul says, you know what? I'm out of here. I've, I've had enough of this. 
I'm going somewhere where the gospel is more receptive. And then we find this encouraging word from the Lord. Acts 18, 9 through 11. It says, one night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision and told him, don't be afraid. Speak out. Don't be silent for I am with you and no one will attack and harm you for many people in this city belong to me. So Paul stayed there for the next year and a half teaching the word of God. Another 18 months Paul stayed around over this encouraging word because ministry is hard work. I'm an ordained elder. I know how difficult it can be. I know the frustration. I know there are times you want to quit and give up and people get on your nerves and and this doesn't happen and you have this problem over here and this issue. It can be overwhelming and sometimes you just want to escape. Paul said, you know what? I just, I, I got to get out of here. But the Lord sends a word, a word of refreshing, a word of renewal. And if there are any people out there who are ministers of the gospel, you out there preaching and you're teaching and you are tired and you are frustrated and you're at your wit's end and you want to quit, I pray that God would send you a word of refreshing. I pray that God would send a word of strength and renewal to continue the fight for the sake of the gospel. I pray that you would see purpose in your pain and that you would rise from the ashes with a new determination and a new focus to finish the work of God. Because you want to say like Paul that I ran my race and I finished my course. Finish your course. In the name of Jesus, to God be the glory. So now, let's look at Paul's third missionary journey. Man, Paul is on a roll here, this third missionary journey. I mean, look at all the cities that Paul hits. I mean, Paul has to be platinum status with American Airlines or United Arab Emirates Airlines or with Delta, whatever airlines. Paul has to have a couple of million miles on his uh, frequent flyer miles. Uh, well, knowing Paul, he probably ruled Spirit Airlines. <laughs> Let's be honest, Spirit Airlines need Jesus. But anyway, Paul probably is on Spirit. But this is a good look at Paul's missionary journeys. Uh, just to get a visual. Let's know how, how extensive his travel was. So now Paul is in Ephesus. He's preaching and they accuse him of blaspheming Artemis. Uh, Ephesus is well known for this Greek goddess called uh, Artemis. And so, of course, as Paul is preaching the gospel, uh, they call him for blaspheming Artemis. And Paul's like, and Paul travels to Macedonia. So for those of you who keep in track, he writes 2 Corinthians. Paul writes Romans. Woo-hoo-hoo-hoo-hoo. We finally get to the book of Romans. Uh, I'm going to make a point about that here in a second. Paul returns to Jerusalem to, for Pentecost. In Troas, a young man named uh, Etuchus dies while Paul is speaking. Paul raises him from the dead. Yeah, this, Paul was speaking. This dude was in a windowsill. He falls asleep, breaks his neck, dies, and Paul uh, fortunately, he goes back and raises it from the dead through the power of God. And then Paul is arrested in Jerusalem. So Paul writes Romans approximately, according to those who are of the scholarly type and who have done their due diligence research, around 56 to 58 AD. Paul, according to estimates, his road to Damascus experience where Paul is saved is around 34 AD. So the point here is Paul has had 20 years of ministry. Paul has traveled to well over 30 plus cities. We don't really know how many he actually traveled to. We only know the ones he went to as documented in scripture. Uh, so if you count them all, it's, it's over 30. So Paul has gone through a whole lot. He has several lifetimes worth of experience. You can take everybody you know and none of us will come close to having the count, a kind of experience and exposure that Paul had. Preaching the gospel, being thrown in prison, being shipwrecked, being left for dead, casting out devils, seeing the Jews saved, seeing the Gentiles saved, coming against idolatry, coming against sexual immorality, turning the world upside down with the gospel. 
20 years. So by the time Paul writes the book of Romans, that brother has something to say, something to impart. And that's what makes it so wonderful. Paul's life is poured into the pages of the book of Romans. Every word, every jot, every tittle through the Holy Spirit. Paul has poured out all of his experiences, all that God has taught him in the pages of the book of Romans. But it took 20 years to get there. So to kind of finish out the timeline, uh, Paul addresses the crowd in Jerusalem. And now he's starting to go before a lot of the masses. And of course, they want to kill him and, you know, all kind of thing. But Paul, you know, being a Roman citizen, he says, hey, I'm a Roman citizen. I, I want to go before Caesar. <laughs> so because Rome is the governing authority, then that takes precedence over Jewish law. They had no choice. So they had to take him before the uh, Roman authorities. Right, so Paul speaks before the Sanhedrin. The Jews plot to kill him. Paul appears to be uh, Paul appeals to be brought before Caesar. He speaks to Felix and Caesarea. King Agrippa hears uh, Paul speak as well. Paul is shipwrecked on Malta. That is in Acts chapter 27. I did a Bible study on that here on the Minister's Corner, so you can go check that out. Paul sails for Rome. He uh, arrives in Rome and lives under house arrest. While in prison, Paul writes. So for those you keeping track, Philippians, Colossians, Ephesians, and Philemon, or Philemon, Paul is released from prison, imprisonment, and travels more. So where he traveled more, this is where we say Paul traveled in places that we probably don't have documented in Scripture. So if you're keeping track, Paul may have written 1st, 2nd Timothy, and Titus at this time, and those were his last letters. So if you want to hear Paul's last words per se, you can read those particular books. And Paul returns to Rome. He is imprisoned and martyred. Wow, what a full life of Paul. And it's amazing how much um, detail we have as it relates to Paul's experiences, his encounters, and of him spreading the gospel. So what I want to do here as we wrap up this particular video is to look at the impact of Paul's missionary journeys because they had have quite the impact on the world. So first of all, the expansion of Christianity, right? Paul's journeys played a pivotal role in early expansion of Christianity. He took the message of Jesus Christ to both Jews and non-Jews uh, communities, making Christianity a global faith. And we can see that as we look at the maps of all of Paul's journeys. Formation of Christian communities. So in the cities he visited, Paul established Christian communities or churches. Hence, when you see Paul writing letters to the church of Ephesus, right? To the church of Corinth. And so we see that a community, a church, a local body, a regional body is developed as a result of Paul's missionary journey. He appointed leaders, taught new believers, and provided guidance for these communities to thrive. And fortunately for us, we have a record of that through his letters of the things that he taught to these new believers. And how he set up leaders because Without Paul, it would be very difficult for us to understand the gospel, to understand who God is and how he moved. And so he was uh, specifically chosen for that purpose. Theological development. Paul's letters, or they're also called epistles, to so the various churches he founded or visited became a significant part of the New Testament. These letters include Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, and others contain profound and theological teachings that continue to shape Christian doctrine. Romans is heavily a doctrinal book. You know, it talks about justification, sanctification, or righteousness, sin. So there is a lot of doctrine within the book of Romans and in other letters that Paul wrote. And in a day and age where we have turned the Bible into a self-help book, uh, a guide to be inspired when we so much of our preaching is about what God can do for us, what God can do for me. Bless me. I need more the job. I need more money. I need to get married. I need to have a child. Help me with this and that. We are slowly losing 
how effective and how important theology is. Theology is a study of God. But if we are constantly seeking his hand instead of seeking his face and learning more about who he is, learning more about God's characteristics, I believe that we will be better off as a church if our preaching and if our teaching was redirected back towards theological development. Not that we don't need to be inspired, not that we don't need help, because Lord knows we do, but there's an imbalance. We can't always be trying to get a self-help to get an answer to your life's issues. We have to have a healthy balance of theology, understanding who God is. And fortunately, we have a lot of it through the Apostle Paul, as well as the Gospels, and as well as the Old Testament to help us in this area of doctrine. Inclusivity of Gentiles. Paul's teachings emphasize the inclusion of Gentiles in the Christian faith, which was a significant theological development. This has led to the growth of a diverse and inclusive Christian community, because at the time period, the Jews didn't associate with uh, Gentiles, and vice versa. You know, the Bible says there was a, a middle wall of partition, which has been torn down. And, by, and, and God has created what the Bible says, one new man. Right. There's neither Greek nor Jew, neither male nor female, but we are all one in Christ Jesus. And so now we have this new body of believers that is composed of both Jew and Gentiles. So the Gentiles, what the Bible says, has been engrafted in. Right. Judaism is sort of the root and Gentiles have been grafted into that rich heritage. Perseverance and suffering. <laughs> what a great case study Paul is on perseverance and suffering. Paul's own experience of uh, persecution, suffering, and imprisonment inspired many believers to endure hardships for the sake of the gospel. His example of faith and resilience is still influential today. Moral and ethical guidance. Paul's letters provide practical guidance on how to live a Christian life. You see that in the latter chapters in the book of Romans. His teachings on love, morality, and ethics continue to be relevant for believers. Paul does a wonderful job of how we should live and act as a believer in Jesus Christ. Bridge between cultures, right? Because there was such animosity and such differences between Jewish culture and uh, non-Jewish culture. So Paul's ability to, with both Jews and Gentiles, helped bridge cultural divides, making it easier for people to, of different backgrounds to embrace Christianity. So we see Paul being able to go into the synagogue and preach and teach to the Jews. And we see Paul able to go to Athens, which is a Greek area, uh, or to Rome, and he writes his letter to the Roman believers. So Paul was so adept between Jew and Gentile that he helped bridge those particular uh, cultures. Legacy in Christian theology, Paul's writings continue to be a cornerstone of Christian theology. We kind of mentioned this already. And his emphasis on grace, faith, and justification by faith has had a lasting impact on Christian thought. Inspiration for future missionaries. Paul's missionary journeys have inspired countless missionaries throughout history to take the gospel to the new regions, believing that the message of Christ can transform lives. So those of you who feel called to the mission fields, of course, you have a, a workbook. You've got a template on how that was done through the life of Paul. So overall, the Apostle Paul's missionary efforts were instrumental in shaping the early Christian church, its theology, and its global reach. His legacy endures, and his impact on the spread of Christianity is immeasurable. Because here we are, thousands of years later, on YouTube, and we're talking about Paul and his effect on the world. Praise the Lord. Well, family, 
That wraps up our study on the life and times of the Apostle Paul. So I hope you're able to grasp and glean, you know, some wisdom and some insight into who is this man called Paul. I hope you enjoyed this lesson. If you did, do me a favor. Please leave me a comment down in the section below and let me know what you thought about this particular section here on the life and times of the Apostle Paul. Now, I'll be back here on Tuesday. Uh, which I believe will be on November the 7th, I believe, at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, where we will continue our Beginner's Guide to the Book of Romans. And in that particular lesson, we're going to look at the historical context of the Book of Romans. You may have heard this phrase, context is king. Well, we're going to go ahead and dive into context uh, in terms of historicity. What was going on you know, at Rome in that particular region at the time? Well, this is Fitz Crito. Just want to say God bless you, and I'll see you in the next video. We'll see you later. Bye bye.